So good morning and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. This morning, I am joined by Levent Yildiz Gorhan, who is um, currently based over in Sussex in the UK, but it was originally from Turkey. And Levent has got, a, he's a co-founder of a business called TTCV Translate, but he's also written a book called, uh, was it Great Business in, or Good Business in Any, in any Language, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Levent. Lovely to have you here. <laughs> Hello, Deborah, and it's great to be on your show. Thank you very much. Hey, look, we'd love to hear a little bit about your story before we get started, because today we're going to talk about international business and what businesses can do to expand into different markets. But I'd love to hear a little bit about you first and, and your story, how you got to where you are, would be a great start. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this. Well, I came to the UK to study when I was 18 years old. So I I lived longer in the UK than I lived in Turkey. And um, what, what interested me in to get into the translation and localization business was the um, excitement that every time we crossed, um, we overcome some cultural and language barriers, it was a great satisfaction. And helping business executives to do the same is realize that this is like a very satisfying thing to do. And um, we uh, co-founded our company, TTCV Translate, with my wife. And um, it, was, it wasn't a kind of um, a logical decision. It was more like emotional. And we very much wanted to control our future. My wife, after our first child was born, didn't want to go back to full-time employment. So we set up a, a, a boutique translation company, mainly doing English to Turkish translations. And around about 1995, we had an opportunity um, to acquire a, a, a smaller business. And also we had a, a, a kind of large project and realized that actually this is the time to, for me to join the company. And uh, so within two weeks, I resigned from my job where I was the director of a printing company. Ah. And within two weeks, we, were, we found ourselves in our living room trying to finish that project while our uh, children with a childminder sitting at the other side of the room, with, you know, we had like fresh doors in between. Yep. And um, I distinctly remember that my daughter coming to the sort of um, door and saying, mommy, mommy, I want to sit on your lap, you know? And every time phone rang, we had to say to them, children, be quiet, you know, turn down the TV, we need to speak to the customers. <laughs> and um, you know, so, so they must have gone some sort of traumatic experience, our children. <laughs> I'm pleased to say they are now, you know, happily grown up adults, you know, with married. And so they are, they, they are happy. But pretty okay. you know, <laughs> at the time, it must have been uh, uh, quite difficult. And for us as well, because now with the pandemic, pandemic, everyone is working remotely. And people are proud to say, well, my dog may come around or my cat may jump on this <laughs> screen so please bear with us or my children may run around at the time it was like not that acceptable and so we were feeling the pressure yeah. and um, so yeah it's, it's been kind of a a, a a long journey but you know we never looked back so that was the that's the best part about it so this is this is where i am today as a result of those those activities and love the fact that we can actually help a business executive overcome cultural and language barriers. Mm, that's awesome. I can see it's your passion. So in terms of, um, we always ask our guests for a professional and a personal best. So what are the two things that you're most proud of, both from a personal sense and from a professional sense? Well, professional sense, I'm really proud of our company. Um, it's been going for, this is our 30th year. And uh, it's been going and it's, it's growing, it's helping. Um, we help charities and we support the United Nations global growth. And, um, you know, we try to give back to the um, language industry, help build an ecosystem. And the second one is really that we created a, um, a competition, translation competition, having noticed the gap between university uh, translation students and the commercial reality, we created that um, uh, competition, translation competition nine years ago with University of Essex 
where we take one of our customers, a real project, real life project to the university, customer explains to students what they want to achieve, what they need the translations for, and we facilitate the translation. So everyone wins because the students get the real experience of a real project. Our customers get exposure being associated with a large uh, educational establishment. And also they get uh, translations that they can use. Of course, it's been checked and checked again and to make sure that this is fit for purpose. So this has been going for nine years. Next year, it will be the 10th year. And I'm really proud of that because as a result of that, that uh, competition, students are getting interested in working in the translation industry. Mm -hmm. And some of them are really finding good jobs likes of Apple, Facebook, Google, and it is really making me proud. Yeah. And it is one of the longest serving initiatives at the University of Essex. So that's, yeah. that's really great. That's great. So the 10th year coming up, that's pretty exciting. It is very, very exciting. And because when we started it, we thought, okay, let's give this a try and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And then the second year is the same, third year, and now, you know, we, we're doing the ninth year. So, yeah. so it's, yeah. it's, it's feeling, and there are two universities want to join the competition. So it's kind of the right. news are spreading. Mm -hmm. And I wish more transition companies do the same because um, for us, it's fun. Yep. Okay, it requires resources, time, um, but it is so rewarding seeing that there are students that are getting inspired by that competition to join our industry. So that's really yeah, great that's pleasure. Fantastic, well done. I think on a personal level, I think it's the, my biggest, uh, uh, what I feel most proud of my children. Uh, they are you know, grown up adults with their, you know, their um, families and uh, seeing them happy and, and, and helping around and everything that's, that makes me really, really proud. Excellent. And you were saying when we were talking earlier that um, the kids used to get involved in the translation business and do the photocopying and help out with the admin and stuff. Have either of them yes. decided to go into their own business? Well, my son has been running multiple businesses and now, now he's working with his wife um, uh, doing Google paid search and, and they're doing really well. Yeah, I think also my daughter is working as a, um, a, a sales, in sales and development in a, in a law firm, global law firm. And they're telling me that the experience they had, you know, getting immersed into the into the business in a way that nothing, nobody was forcing them. They just wanted to do it themselves. Mm -hmm. And then what they did at the time from the age of like 12, 13, they, re that they realized that they are benefiting so much from that because they, they're saying that they can adapt to changing circumstances very quickly and nothing is too much trouble for them. So, so they are grateful that they have taken part which makes me really proud. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> Pleased to hear it. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit now about yeah, international business. And I, and I guess, you know, it's your, it's your area of expertise, but your book that's, yeah. you know, good business in, in any, any language. Um, tell me a little bit about what it is you actually do with companies. So you've talked about working with companies and helping them, um, yeah, helping them find where they can, what markets they can enter into. But what does that yeah. look like? Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for asking that. Well, that's, that's, that's a great question. Now, as a business owner myself, you know, it is so easy to get immersed into profit and loss account and, and try to cut the cost and control the cost. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not suggesting we shouldn't. We should because, you know, it's, it's, we're working hard for our cash. But to grow the company, controlling the cost isn't enough. In fact, it takes it takes the mindset to a, to a wrong place, I believe. Mm. And looking at global brands and successful companies, the ones that really grow healthily and steadily, and they sustain it by taking their products or services to international markets, because that gives them, they have they've taken, they must have spent years to develop their service or product. It's fine tuned, they have, a, a, you know, product and service, and they just take it to a new market. Yeah. Is it straightforward? Is it easy? No, it's not. But but the rewards are so high, and we've seen this example in large companies. Two thousand nine, Apple said they are taking iPhone to China. 
Now, everyone knew iPhone by then. It was a successful product. It was working really well, had a loyal customer base. And the moment they said that, their share price gone up even more because stock market knew that by taking, you know, having a different, another channel, they will grow. Considering China is such a huge market, yeah. you know, that was no, no brainer. But same applies to small to medium-sized companies. You know, by going to a new market, they just have, they just, you know, the domestic market may come to a saturation point. Their um, competition may get higher, you know. So by just going to another, reaching to another market who hasn't tested that product or service, they have get so much more opportunities. I've seen this many, many times uh, over with working with dozens of customers over the years. And okay, that transformation, we realize that we can help that transformation, mainly by helping them overcome cultural and language barriers. Mm -hmm. But then seeing the mistakes that keep coming, coming by, you know, by some companies, but many companies do similar mistakes over and over again. And I realized that actually, the ones who are successful are following a strict methodology. Yes. And I said, what can we do from our experience? What can we do? How can we guide them you know, with, with a methodology? methodology? So as a result, I developed a methodology we call Lingo. It's a, it is a five simple step uh, methodology to go global. It can be applicable to any business, whether product-based or service-based. And it's not a rocket science. This is just following uh, uh, those steps to achieve that, that result. So that's what we do for, for our customers. We, we help them to get, um, reach those um, target customers adapting their messages, adapting their user guides, software mm -hmm. or, or interfaces to make sure that the target audience actually makes sense of what they are hearing from those companies. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because as you said, it's certainly not an easy process, but it has huge rewards um, for the company. Yes. What I mean, I'm sure some of my listeners have probably tried it before or are thinking about going into a new market. What would be the biggest um, sort of common mistakes or pitfalls that a business would make when trying to enter into a new market? Great, great question, Deborah. Thank you for asking this. Um, the one that I come across most is that assuming what worked in the domestic market will work anywhere. Yeah. I think that is the biggest mistake. That, that requires you know, reaching to a different um, uh, target audience in another country requires a, a, a different mindset. The cultural and language barriers are a lot higher than we give them credit for. Mm. I think the, there's a big misconception that everybody speaks English. That's partly true. You know, there's, there's, there's a, a lot of people speak English, understand English, but they don't make purchasing decisions on their second language. <laughs> it, is, it is, you know, it's their native language that they immerse the information, yep. get an emo emotional connection with the product or service, then it leads them to make that, that purchasing decision. It's funny, so, you remind me, because my mum was actually German. And so, and she'd lived in the UK since she was 19 years old. So she was very much British. However, whenever she counted, she counted in German. And whenever she <laughs> dreamt, she dreamt in German. So despite English wow. being in a, her natural kind of first language after many, many years, yeah, yeah. she still always reverted back to German for dreaming and counting. <laughs> yes, I mean, cultural, culture and languages is what, what, makes us in a way, isn't it? Yes. You know, so it's, it's very natural. What you described is very, very interesting, but it's, I find it very natural. Yeah, okay. So they do it. So they revert back to their sort of, um, well, we revert back to our sort of natural language to start engaging with the product to, to do our research and whatnot. Um, and so what is that, if you haven't done your homework, what can go wrong? 
<laughs> but a lot, a lot con- unfortunately, a lot, a lot con- can go wrong if a business executive doesn't do that, you know, the right research or doesn't go deeper into the market to understand certain barriers. Mm-hmm. And um, so I've got one example, a very great company producing industrial solvent, good product, they sell very well. And um, a distributor persuades them to take their product into Polish market. And um, so the minimum that they can take is 5,000 units. Mm-hmm. So the packaging, the labeling and everything has to done in, in, the, in that many units and the transport logistics. And when I spoke to them, they said, well, we never do international trade again because that was a disaster, you know? Oh. And once we continued speaking, then I realized that they acted on what they heard. So they didn't do any due diligence. Right. And as a result, they say never again. So that's a, that's a great shame because they're kind of creating a barrier themselves not to do any more international trade, whereas they have a great product. Maybe Poland wasn't the right market for them, yeah. but it, it is possible that they're next door to Poland may be a market or, or Germany, which is a big country in industrially you know, developed and everything. Maybe Germany is a, is a great, could be a great market. It's just a matter of doing this initial research mm. to make sure that there is a demand for that product. And often this research can be done by our computers using Google, research, Google Trends, Google Keyword Planner. Those are free tools that help us to gauge that, that, um, that volume of searches. And it, that gives an idea because they're already selling that product in their home country. So they can see actually, they can compare the searches and, and gauge, is it viable to take, to take that product or service to that country? So, I, I yeah. suppose also it's about thinking about, um, I, mean, I, I mean, English is a language which you say is widely used, but it can mean so many different things, in, you know, in different ways or use different words. So I work with an American based company who is based all around the world. Um, but, you know, you talk to somebody from Europe, you talk to somebody from the UK, you talk to somebody from um, the US or from Australia or New Zealand. <laughs> and yeah. we actually use different words for the same <laughs> thing. I mean, I, I'm wearing yeah. a pair yeah. of flip flops at the moment on my feet because I'm sitting in my in my own studio. But over here, they're called jandals and in uh, the Australia they're called thongs and in the US thongs, yeah, I'm, yeah. Not, I'm not quite sure what they're called so, um, so it's really interesting that, 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 that yeah, even, yeah, even yeah. something of the same language can actually have quite different meanings yeah absolutely right like um, confectionery oh, yes, in sweets. the USA is known as candy yes but candy wouldn't make any sense here yeah. you know and uh, also I, I mean you're, you're originally from the UK so you will know this it took me years to understand it. Then my English friend said, I quite like this. Uh, that's a really high praise. It took me years to understand it, actually. <laughs> they didn't like it. <laughs> they were just being polite. Yes, OK, yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, but there is, when Americans say, I quite like it, they, they like it, they like it very much. And mm. So, you know, yes, with the, even with the same language, there could be, you know, the meanings could be, could be very different. Yeah. So you're speaking my language because market validation is something that I actually trained in and I know it's really important. I'd never considered it for, you know, overseas markets because I only work generally in the, in the local area. But um, how does it sort of differ? I know you can do some things online. And I, and I, I think I heard you say that the customer had listened to what they'd been told. Um, but it was, they've only spoken to one person. Is that right? Or they've spoken to a couple of people and built up a whole business plan based on speaking to a couple of people rather than really delving deeper. Is that what you were saying? Very much, yes. It is, um, it's actually doing this market research in a way that to, to gauge the, the customer demand yeah. so that they can actually, when they've taken that step, there's no surprises. Mm-hmm. And um, one of my customers, they sell... Uh, hangers in, in, in all, all across um, Europe. And what, what they noticed that it is the, the customer's habits are different when it comes to using hangers. Some use 
wooden hangers, some oh, use metal, oh, some so use hangers plastic. for the old wardrobe. Okay, yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was, yeah, so yeah, I was yeah, imagining yeah. aircraft hangers. I was thinking, oh, okay. Yeah. No. <laughs> I should have made it clear. Yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> That's yeah. okay. So, yeah, so, so hangers. Yeah, so some use yeah. plastic, some use wood, so, some use whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And there's so many different types of hangers. You know, there's hangers for skirts and trousers and jackets and t shirts. And just making sure that which one is in demand in that country. Yeah. If if they say that okay the the wooden hangers in the UK are selling very well so yeah come on we'll 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 just ship so many thousands to to this market. Yeah. Whereas you know just understanding the habits of this target audience, which type of uh, hangers they prefer, mm -hmm. and once once they start asking those questions, I think they they get to the right results. Because it's, it's like understanding, not, it's not what I like, it's what my customer may like, and I need to find, find out what that is. Mm. And also, in, even in Europe, there are differences in regards to holidays. You know, if the product is, is, a, is, is a product is requires logistics is important and requires to get to the customers on certain times, then, for instance, Easter is coming. But Easter holidays are different between the UK and, and, and other European countries. Ah. Even, um, even in Germany, there are um, different regional holidays. So these are small details, but can have a big impact on logistics. Yes. And it's so easy, they are so easy to find. I think the, the, the curiosity, there needs to be a curiosity. There needs to be a sort of a really a methodology to follow. Okay, what are the habits in this country? Mm -hmm. What is the languages? What are the cultural habits? Is the Facebook country, Google AdWords, will it work or we need something else? You know, what's the chats they use? How do they make payment? Mm -hmm. In China, they use, you know, they don't pay. even use credit cards anymore. They use mobile pay, yeah. you know, Alipay, I think something called, even street traders, they accept. Yeah. Pay. Pay. Nobody <laughs> wants cash anymore. Yes. You know? So understanding all these uh, details, nuances. Yeah. nuances helps them succeed. You know, it's, um, so it's really not rocket science. It just requires a mindset mm. to be curious and find out exactly what is. So I say very much like um, a good project management skills can help a lot. Yeah. And I think in your flyer that I saw about, you know, talking about what you talk about, you said that there's things like, you know, even just things like silence um, can mean different things culturally in different um, countries yeah, and yeah, a handshake, yeah. you know, we, we was always taught to a very firm handshake, but that yeah, isn't yeah. always <laughs> necessarily the case. Can you share a little bit of a little a couple of examples of those kind of nuances for me? Because I think I, I find that fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love, I love that question. Yes. Um, well, I mean, like, Interruptions, yeah. you know, interruptions, frequent interruptions can come across a little unfriendly in, in the UK, in the States, I'm sure in the same in New Zealand. You know, if I keep interrupting you, you may think that maybe, you know, he's not interested in speaking. But in Latin culture, frequent interruptions shows engagement. Uh -huh. And nobody gets mind about it, you know. And um, silence is one that I love because... Um, like um, silence, I mean, even five seconds of bit, bit, anything between five and 10 in a, in, a, in a formal meeting can feel like a lifetime. Okay. I heard this from, uh, <laughs> from somebody who experienced it and he was in the uh, Middle East. Um, you know, so somebody walked in the, the, the meeting, before the meeting took place, there was a silence of like maybe 10 seconds. I mean, he felt like two minutes and he said, <laughs> What have I done? You know, have I done something wrong? They don't, don't, they don't want to speak with me anymore. You know, so he was having all these wild uh, thoughts, and then all they were doing, they, they, they were settling the room, mm -hmm. they were setting the scene, and then after that, then he realized that it was just a, a, a customer thing. And in Far East, when somebody stopped speaking. Before other person speaks, they wait to show that actually I heard what you said and I, I'm processing what you said. Then they 
and then they start replying or speaking. So it's very much like used in different different um, ways yeah. by different cultures. I mean, you might say, look, how will a business executive know all these things? Mm. You know, well, it is not that difficult. Once, once we have an open mind, I think the biggest, biggest thing that makes a difference is recognizing that there are different cultures and we need, all we need to look for science, science of what is taking place around us. Forgetting our home environment and something like hierarchy is very important in certain cultures, certain mm -hmm. countries. So understanding who is the leader of the group, if there are like multiple people entering the room, a bit, one of the sign in, in hierarchical countries is that the person that enters the room first is more likely to be the head of the delegation. And, uh, and, the, and the same way when, it, when the meeting ends, they, they are more than likely to leave the room first. first. You know, somebody junior, they wouldn't leave the room before that head of the uh, meeting, head of the group would leave the room. And, yes. and also in that respect, when person addresses the, per, the other person who is junior, could come across very unfriendly. Mm -hmm. So a business executive in this environment, all they have to do is just watch for the signs, having an open mind and say, who is the head of this delegation? Who is this head of the room? Yeah. You know, finding this out it can save them a lot, of, um, yeah. a lot of hassle. One simple mistake that I'm sure we, we, we all must do that, you know, in a meeting, if it's a hot day, take off your jackets, roll up your sleeves, Come on, let's do business. Yeah, that's perfect. That may sound perfectly normal in a kind of um, uh, American environment or, or in the UK, but yep. in, in Far East, that can come across very hostile as well. Mm. You know, taking off your jacket, rolling up your sleeves, ready for a fight. As if, yeah, you're ready for a fight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. So, just I think it's just a matter of recognizing that there could be different interpretations and just look for those signs mm. to understand well, what's going on it is absolutely fascinating I'm just thinking you know in New Zealand there's no hierarchy about who comes into the meeting room first everybody just bowls and when they're ready and yeah, yeah, we yeah. Go. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, so yeah, yeah it is yeah, it is yeah. absolutely fascinating um tell me a little bit very quickly about handshakes because I saw that in your in your um, brochure so what's the thing about handshakes well I mean normally a firm handshake is a sign of sincerity at least we think so in the, in the Western <laughs> Hemisphere. But in Far East, no, handshake is not part of the culture. It's the, it's the bowing, you know? Right. So it's, because it's not part of the culture, a firm handshake can come across wrong. So if the handshake is soft, the important thing is not to interpret it as insincerity. Mm. It is because it is, you know, handshakes are not part of the culture. And, you know, for a business executive, soft handshake doesn't mean they shouldn't, they shouldn't try to interpret that, <laughs> yeah. okay, you know, this, this guy is not, or oh, this woman is not interested. You know, it is, I think it's just a matter of keeping an open mind. Yeah. And, and some, another thing that are interesting is that taking calls in a meeting, right. you know, which is normally, you know, if I was to take a call while I'm speaking with you, okay, this is a different environment, it's a <laughs> <Yeah>. podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but even but in a meeting, yeah. You know, even in a meeting can come across really sort of strange. Uh, but in, in some countries, there's nothing wrong with that. They, they just, they'll do like, they believe in doing multiple multitasking. Mm. And uh, if that's the case, I shouldn't take it, I shouldn't take any offense in that. Yes. Because it's not, Nothing personal. personal. It's just what, yeah. what, it's what they do. So they take, or sometimes in a in a meeting environment, they are likely to speak to multiple people at the same time. Hmm. Okay, it's not ideal because it's I I don't I wouldn't want to say anything confidential in a in this sort of environment. Yeah. But then waiting for the right moment could solve the problem. Um, it is just a matter of understanding what's going on and not taking any offense 
unnecessarily yeah. and then just just looking for the signs of trying to understand what are the norms in that environment. <laughs> Perfect. I'm sure there's a, there's a way to shortcut it as well, though, is by working with someone like you who actually understands it. Hey, tell me a little bit about your book. So what is your book you. designed to do? Has a gr- good business in any language? What, tell me a little bit about it. Thank you. Thank you for asking, Dara. I appreciate that. Well, what I say is that a business should never re- rely on a single customer. That would be crazy, you know? So, so yeah, we, we always look for multiple customers, as many as possible. So why do you lie on a single market? You know? So when it comes to trading, tr- trading internationally in multiple markets makes pure sense as far as, as far as I can see, and as far as I can see from the success of the global brands. Yeah. So the book is about very much about this five-step uh, methodology that I call Lingo, Lingo yeah. explaining how they can implement, how a business executive can implement to take their business to uh, mark, uh, new, new, new export markets. Yep. And I give a few case studies, success stories, and um, certain statistics just to help a business executive to say, right, okay, this can work. This can work for my, um, for my business. I can do this. Yep. I can do this and I can get the rewards. Perfect. So we'll come back to where they can get hold of that in a moment. Just before we finish up, because time has passed so quickly. Um, do you have three <laughs> top tips or tools that the listeners could, um, you know, take on board and perhaps go and action something? Well, the three that comes to mind is that I think the most important thing for a business executive is developing a mindset that that global trade is beneficial. So nurturing that mindset is is so important that's that's my that's my first mm. first tip and yep. the second one is thinking global everything around us is a global angle the the the, the product we use we, we whether, whether we use a smartphone of known brands is likely to be marketed in one country produced in another the components of this will come from this country. You know, it is a combination of international effort. So everything we have has got an international flavor. So think global, develop a mindset. And third tip, if I may say, read my book. <laughs> of course. No, without a doubt, I, I'm going to recommend that. So t- tell us not where they can. My book. Yeah. No. Well, you can see this case I mean, that is just my book. Other... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not just my book. It's just reading a book. I mean, I learned a lot from Traction, you know, mm. Gino Wickman's Traction. I learned so much from that. And, and I always recommend to others, you know, it's, it's an operating system for entrepreneurs. Mm. So trying to find out, you know, what global trade does, how it works. It's not just my book. There are other books as well. So having this curiosity that will lead them to the books that they will it will, they will find it very helpful. Now, I'd love to offer my book to your listeners. Great. Free of yes. charge. Yep. They need to visit levant.team and they can, there are three options. They can either get an ebook uh, version of the, of the book. They can buy it from Amazon if they wanted it. Yep. Or they can get paperback version and we send it free of charge to UK-based uh, uh, visitors so so there are three options and it's totally free and uh, i'll be and also i'll be very happy to answer anyone who has a question about international trade cultures and languages so how so how do they get in contact with you again just remind us of the best way to get in contact with you uh, visit visit levant.team yep um, or find me in linkedin um, my surname is uh, quite unique i don't think there are many <laughs> Yildiz Gören in, in LinkedIn. Yes. And, um, or they can search with the na- name of the book. It's, 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 it comes up in, in searches. Wow. But the best best one is like visiting levant.team yep. to get the book. Also, there are a couple of goodies. Also, we have a Facebook group that they, uh, listeners can join to ask questions and see what other people are doing in relation to international trade. 
Wow, that's fantastic. Hey, look, I mean, you mentioned the book Traction, and obviously I'm an EOS implementer. We talk about the EOS life, which is doing what you love with people you love, making a huge difference, um, being compensated appropriately in time to pursue other passions. It sounds very much <laughs> to me, listening to you, that you're leading that life. Um, and I thank you yes. for all the work mm. that you do for helping others. So thank, thank you, you for coming on board this morning. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and your wisdom, um, especially late in the evening. Uh, I shall look forward to actually looking at that book myself. <laughs> Thank you, Deborah. It's been a total pleasure being on your show. Thank oh, you. That's awesome. Thank you.